listo we can start our discussion so uh, we talk about stress today i am pretty sure all of you have taken classes in physics and you discussed both in school and in the university about forces now in structural geology uh, and in civil engineering as well uh, we talk about stress now uh, you will see uh, the uh, word traction uh, it's usually uh, used mostly in uh, in engineering but it has the same significance so when we talk about stress we talk about the intensity of the force so what happens uh, at a certain point the intensity of a force so it is in a nutshell it is the force divided by uh, the area over which it is applied so you can see uh, look at it as a mathematical limit yeah when the area tends to be zero so what we'll do i'll show you some examples i will try intuitively to introduce to you the this concept of stress and you'll see that you are already familiar with it you might not be aware but you are i'll show you in a bit and then we'll talk about stress on a plane yeah on a plane and at a point and then we'll talk about some very specific concepts in structural geology which would be something called deviatoric stress mean stress differential stress and then i'll introduce to you something that might seem to you initially as difficult but it is not believe me it is not but this is called the more circle um, and you will use this a lot in the mechanica del continuo so it is better for you to get familiar with it because you will have to take the mechanica del continuo course and then you will have to deal with this and then we'll have a bit of geology discussing about stress in the lithosphere and uh, i'll show you a few things but first let's let's look intuitively so you will be geoscientists and geologists but before being this we all enjoy nature that's why we are in this field and we all enjoy uh, spectacular views of uh, natural phenomena and this is one of them now if you think about this yeah this is a, an image you see from a national park in Utah, in the United States. Uh, and this is a sandstone. It's a red sandstone, and it's an erosional remnant. What this means, it is, you see the erosion eliminated the rest of the sandstone layer here, and you have this erosional remnant. But you, you can figure out here something that looks like a big, big boulder which sits atop this column of sandstone here. So let's think about this. What would be the force here? The force would be basically given by the weight of this boulder, yeah? So this is simple physics. Now think about this. The stress is the intensity of the force over this very small surface here. Now, if we had a larger surface to sustain this, yeah, the force would be distributed over a larger area. So the stress at each point, the intensity at each point would be less. All right. So that's the idea of stress. Let's look at some at some other intuitive situations. Um, you see, you can do this experiment. Yeah, you have a, a mass here. It's one kilo and you have uh, a uh, board yeah a board and depending on how big the board is this iron weight would float or not on top of the board because if if the board is too small they would both sink but if it's large enough the uh, basically the weight would be distributed over this large board yeah and then it wouldn't sink now let's say you are the curator in a museum in a museum and you have this reconstruction of a dinosaur like here and you want to display it now you have to pay attention to 
the <laughs> pedestal on which you want to put it yeah because depending on its weight it has to be a large enough surface yeah to transmit kind of relatively small stresses on this surface and it wouldn't break whereas you see here you'd have this table yeah and the stress here would be really large because you have a small surface so the intensity of the force would be very large and it would break yeah let's look at some of our practical examples you all have taken road trips and you've seen these signs yeah now this is another image of a bridge from this is also from utah in the united states but uh an at an older time than this color image uh, someone took this photograph when they passed on this bridge so this photograph is what you are going to see when you approach the bridge and it shows something very interesting you see all these um trucks camiones yeah and you see that depending on the number of axles so these are basically the uh, pairs of wheels they have larger and larger weights are allowed the reason being that you that you cannot put 36 tons only distributed on these two axles yeah only distributed on these four wheels but you can put 36 tons if you have four of these four pairs yeah so the idea is how you distribute the weight yeah so this is something that i'm pretty sure all of you have seen yeah so that's why people have to pay attention the the drivers they have to pay attention to these things because this is no joke that you don't want the bridge to collapse yeah the bridge is is dimensioned is sized for a certain stress now this is something which happens in the northern countries where you have winter like now in the northern hemisphere like in Europe and in uh, the United States, Northern United States and Canada. And lakes freeze and people like going skating. I told you I used to live in Canada and I was next to a river and the local authorities, the city authorities, every winter, they would put a sign like this uh, uh, on the shore and they would tell people if it's safe or not to go on the ice of the river so you see in this case this person didn't pay attention to this sign saying that it's thin ice but what happens you see the weight of this person they lifted one foot and the all the weight is distributed only on this very narrow surface of the skate so the stress is very high so look at the stress calculation here you divide the force by the area yeah and this is a stress now here is a rescuer coming to rescue this person and the rescuer he knows physics so he understands it so he takes a, a big board yeah takes a big board to distribute its weight so if we are to calculate the stress yeah the stress that this board transmits to the ice, you see what it is. So you see the difference between the stress in this case and the stress in this case, and the force is almost the same. You see, this is this guy is a big, uh, a bigger than this guy. So this is what you do if you happen to go uh, in a northern country and someone is is in need of help. That's what you need to do. All right. So you see now the idea of stress now let's move like in in a physics class let's move a bit to uh, again we intuitively but to picture yeah to picture the stress and the stress when we talk about stress on a plane yeah stress on a plane the stress is a vector it's the same like a force so it can be decomposed into for instance two components you see a normal component to the plane and the shear component to the plane. Yeah. So basically, you would have a vector if you add these two components, you would have a vector. Yeah. You see, 
for instance, the stress also travels from the muscle. The muscle pushes, pushes the hand of this person. So there is stress here, yeah, in the cir circumference of the arm here. But what happens, you see here you have in, on this plane, you have only normal stress. There is no shear component because it's perpendicular. All the stress is perpendicular, transmitted. But here it's not gonna be, it's oblique. So that's why we can decompose it. All right, now we kind of go more into what a typical physics class looks like. So now we looked at intuitive situations. Now we just represent very simple uh, these ideas by using these arrows, these vectors. So you see, we talk about forces. We can talk about force or we can talk about stress. Now, when we talk about force, we can decompose it into a normal component and a, a tangential component. In terms of stress, we talk about normal stress and shear stress. And what um, N and S are the same as sigma? Yeah, sigma, yes, uh, yes, uh, sigma can be a notation for stress. You'll see it in a bit. Uh, can be sigma N, <laughs> yes, Laura, sigma N and sigma S. So what happens here is where we will where you might be a bit surprised because the actual values and behavior of these components is not similar to the it's not parallel to the components of normal force and tangential force in terms of their magnitudes the normal one Yes, but the, you'll see in a bit, but the, the shear one, it's not very intuitive. So let's go into, don't get scared. I'll explain everything here. This is from the book. You'll have time to, to basically assimilate all this. But think, the, the, you all took physics. This is a simple physics problem, yeah? You see here the force, yeah? You see here the force. You see, you see it how it acts on this surface, yeah? And let's say this surface has, a, has the area of A1, yeah? So here is very simple to calculate the stress. It's only normal stress, you see it's sigma. Uh, we don't have a shear stress component. So sigma here coincides with the normal component on A1, okay? Imagine that this is a cylinder of rock because you might wonder what is the relation ship with geology. And in geology, when we talk about folds, which are planes, yeah? So that's why we are interested in what happens on these planes and what causes failure and movement and deformation of rocks. That's why we are discussing about these things. So like in physics, my question is, if I were a physics teacher, I would say, well, let's look what happens on this plane, like oblique plane here. So you'd say, okay, in terms of forces, no problem. We decompose the force like this, normal component, tangential component, and with this angle, with a bit of trigonometry, we can get their values based on the value of F. But my, now I'm saying to you, what are the relationships for these two components here, normal and shear? And here is the thing. The difference is that you have to look at the definition of stress, yeah? It is force divided by the area, yeah? So the area here is A2, you see A2, which is A1 divided by the cosine of this angle, theta, angle of inclination of, of this plane, yeah? So if you were to calculate these two components by starting from the definition, you see here at the bottom, you see the definition, sigma n and sigma s. Now, the two components, fn and fs, as I said, it's very simple, very simple trigonometric relationships, but divided by a2. Being divided by a2, you end up with these relationships. You see these relationships. And basically, if you want to, to calculate as a function of sigma, not as a function of f, yeah, as a function of sigma, you end up 
with these two relationships. So sigma n is the total stress, yeah, the intensity of the total vector times the square of the cosine and uh, sigma s is this formula sigma times half of sine of two theta, okay? These are relationships. So you might say, well, I'm happy. I used algebra and trigonometry to calculate this. But in our minds, let's see what this means by looking at these graphs. So let's plot these quantities as a function of the angle. So angle means you start from a horizontal plane and you kind of turn the plane up to the 90 degrees, up to the 90 degrees. And here is very interesting. As you increase the angle from zero to 90, so you start deeping the plane more and more and more, you see how Fn and sigma n behave kind of parallel. Yeah, they, they behave like when it's zero, the highest value of Fn, yeah, because it's the whole vector here, yeah, the density of the vector, it's the highest sigma n. And when we have 90 degrees, if you look at this formula, you only have 90 degrees, it's zero because cosine of uh, the angle of 90 is zero, yeah? So it kind of makes sense. We, we don't have a normal component when it's vertical here. But let's look at, and here is where it's less intuitive and uh, you might be surprised. Here is what happens with the shear stress in terms of the variation of the angle. While you see that the shear force or the tangential component of the force keeps increasing as you grow the angle because you get less and less of a normal component and more of a tangential component. Not the same happens with the shear stress. The shear stress will reach a maximum at 45 degrees, like here, and then will start decreasing. So when, when it's basically, when it is um, vertical, the shear stress gets to zero. So what I meant to say is, it might seem surprising to you, but the idea is that if you look at these relationships, you can draw yourself these curves uh, as a function of the angle and uh, feel it for yourself, okay? So that's where the complication comes a bit. All right, this is in the book, so you'll have time to assimilate this, don't worry. Now, we have to complicate things a bit because we have planes, but also what happens at the point? At the point, we have an infinity of planes going through a point. Yeah, we can imagine we have an infinity, many, many planes, an infinity of planes going through a point, yeah? So the idea is you to, de to define the state of stress at a point, you can start doing it in such a way. You can start taking various planes or various orientation through this, through this, uh, point and look at the magnitude of the stress vector. And when you look at the magnitude of the stress vector and you look for the end of the stress vector, you can draw an ellipsoid in three dimensions. Now, if you are in a plane, it's an ellipse. You can draw an ellipse. So basically this ellipsoid or this ellipse in 2D defines, it's a description of the state of stress at a point. I know it sounds a bit artificial because our mind is not used to thinking about this. That's why we use mathematics as a tool. And here is a very good example how we use the mathematical concepts. Mathematics is an invention, yeah? We invented it as a tool so that we can, our mind can picture what's going on, yeah? So imagine, now you all know what an ellipse is or an ellipsoid. So an ellipse, let's take a start with an ellipse. An ellipse will have two principal axes, one like this 
and one like this, yeah? The short axis and the long axis. The ellipsoid will have, will have three such axes, yeah? It's in 3D. So each of these axes, basically, are called principal axes of stress. What this means is that there are only three directions at each point, only three directions, where the stress vector is normal to the plane and you have no shear component. In all other directions, the stress vector will have a normal component and the shear component. It's oblique to the plane. So what I mean to say is that the stress of the state of stress at the point can be described by an ellipsoid. And the axis of the ellipsoid will show you what's called the principal axis of stress, where the stress is basically normal to the plane. Yeah. So that's what it means. Okay, now this is a geometric representation of the stress at the point. And here, this is taken from the two books that we use in this, in this class. Uh, they explain these things. Uh, I explain them because human interaction, it would be better if we were in a classroom, yeah? Human interaction is better than reading such dry things, very boring, in my opinion. So, <laughs> the stress ellipsoid, yes, basically, if you know it, it tells you, uh, and the orientation of the stress ellipsoid, it tells you about the state of stress at a given point in a rock. So what this principal directions of stress of pre or principal stresses show you, it's like, where is the main stress coming from? It comes from a plate margin or it is due to the uh, cover of rocks above this point due to their weight. Because in some cases, the principal has a, a question. Who has a question? Yes. Gabriel. Thank you, teacher. Uh, I, I'm trying to imagine a surface uh, yes. uh, which is uh, suffering some stress stresses uh, several, in, in several directions. So uh, I don't understand how, uh, I, I don't understand what you say uh, when, when you mean that there are three directions possible to be uh, uh, in a normal stress. I don't. Yes. I, uh, is it a conception, mathematical conception, or is it a physical conception? Conception. Well, it is. I, it is a physical yes. reality. It is a physical reality, Gabriel, which we picture it mathematically. So what this means, you go somewhere in a rock. Let's say you have a granite, and somewhere deep in this granitic body, you wonder. Of course, it's a it's a mental exercise. You cannot go there physically, but it's a mental exercise. Uh, what is the state of stress in a, at a point? Now, that point is not moving. So if you have one stress in this direction, you'll have one stress in the opposite direction. And that happens for all the possible directions. So basically everything is static. So we talk about here, here we talk about statics. So uh, what happens is we discussed the state of stress on a plane, yeah? So in this point in the granite, there are an infinity of planes that you can select. You select one and you, what would be the stress on this plane? And on this plane, you'll have a stress vector and it will have a normal component and the shear component. And the same happens for another, uh, for another, plane and for an hour plane and for an hour plane. But then out of this infinite number of planes, there are only three planes, three planes on which the stress vector on the plane is orthogonal, as you wrote, is normal to the plane. It has no shear component. There are only three out of the infinite number. And these three planes are perpendicular to this axis of this ellipsoid that we can imagine that exists 
and the ellipsoid, basically the surface of the ellipsoid, is basically showing you the magnitude of all the stress vectors in all the directions. In all, any direction, if you take the, the distance from the center of the ellipsoid to this point here, this would be the magnitude of the stress along this direction at this point. Yeah, that's what happens. I know, it, uh, believe me, Gabriel, as it is difficult for you and for your colleagues to grasp these things that seem kind of artificial, it's as difficult to convey them because, of course, we are, we, it's just in our imagination. We cannot see the forces. Yeah. So, because we cannot see the forces, we have to understand them in an abstract way. And that's why we use mathematics. You might like geometry, and this is a geometric may description I, of the stress at the point. May I uh, give a synthesis uh, to see if I understood? Uh, for example, here in the picture, uh, on the slide, I see some some kind of surface, blue one, blue, a clear blue one. Yes. So, um, and uh, at this, uh, at the, the, the core uh, of the ellipsoid, uh, the vectors are converging. So, yes. uh, uh, in this sense, if I imagine, this uh, this um, uh, th this surface like a, a, a seen by profile, uh, I, I I see only one vector which is uh, or two vectors which are uh, normal to that. Yes. To that. You are right. Uh, you are right. You see sigma one here. Like Sigma one is the principal stress. So the blue the surface, yes. what Gabriel is saying is that the plane represented by the blue surface here is basically the plane on which Sigma one acts. And basically Sigma one doesn't have a shear component. It's orthogonal to this plane because what this ellipsoid shows, it shows the principal directions uh, of stress so and the principal the plane, but it didn't show all the three planes, yeah, because it would make a mess. <laughs> um, okay, for example, yeah. I might I might say that the other planes in which they, the vectors could be many uh, yeah. reflected are, are in front of mine yes. and. Uh, yes. Laura, Laura asked about if sigma two is a shear stress. No, Laura. Sigma two is also a normal stress on the plane, which is not shown here. It's a plane perpend that contains sigma one and it's perpendicular on sigma two. So what I want to tell you, this is out of the infinity of possibilities of moving from this point to the surface of the ellipsoid. There are only three which define the main axis of this ellipsoid. They are all perpendicular to each other. Yeah, each, so what happens, Laura, sigma one is perpendicular to this plane. We talked about stress on a plane. Sigma two, sigma two is not a shear stress in this plane, actually. It is a normal stress yeah, in, in the plane perpendicular to sigma two. So, so basically, uh, what I'm trying to say is that if someone came, yeah, if so, it's, it is another plane, yeah, it is, and there is another plane perpendicular on sigma three, which contains sigma one and sigma two. So all these are normal stresses, and each sigma one, sigma two, sigma three have a corresponding plane. But this figure shows only one plane, the one corresponding to sigma one. You have to, to imagine the other two so that it doesn't seem too complicated. All right? Now, what happens, let, let me go a bit, you'll, you'll, I'll, I'll give you help in the textbooks, you'll see more. I imagine octants, octants in geometry. Okay, uh, so here is one thing. Let's imagine a simple situation. Let's imagine the ellipsoid, and this is what this says, is not an ellipsoid, it's a sphere. Yeah, so the a particular case of an ellipsoid is a sphere. So the three axes, basically, are the radius, yeah, the radius of the sphere. 
and the radius is everywhere. It is a very special case. And this is what water. In water, yeah, the water has no shear strength, no shear strength. So in water, you don't have shear stresses. So on each plane, imagine you, you, you go into the water at two meters depth, you go there. At each point, uh, let's say you are a point, yeah, imagine you are a point. The, we call this stress, we call it pressure in the water. So the pressure is the same, yeah, on each plane. Uh, yes, David, but, but we can use the more circle, but I didn't get there yet. <laughs> yeah. So you are ahead of time here. So um, the thing is that basically this is a particular case where the stress, the stress is the same everywhere in all directions, and it is normal on each plane. And this is what happens in the liquids, yeah? The liquids have no shear strength, and because of this reason, because of this reason, you have what is called, in the case of liquids, hydrostatic state of stress. But in the rocks, if you don't have tectonic stresses and so on, you can imagine the rocks as transmitting, yeah, the stress at a point, at depth, due to the weight of the rocks, would be the same in all direction, and we call that the lithostatic state of stress. So it is the stress is like pressure, the same in all directions. Yeah, but because we have tectonic stresses, for instance, something that preferentially along some directions pushes more from afar, the state of stress at any point in the rocks is not necessarily lithostatic. We have situations that create differences depending on the direction. Yeah, so that's why we we discuss these kind of difficult things. Now, let me go a bit more with this, uh, Gabriel. Thank you for asking. I think it's good uh, you ask. And some of you like algebra. Some of you like geometry. So what happens? I'm showing in this slide the same thing. This is in terms of what it means, it is the same thing as what, what we discussed so far with this ellipsoid. So basically, how you can define the state of stress at a point is that you use what's called a tensor, a second order tensor. This is a tensor, algebraically speaking. A vector is a first order tensor. So when you talk about stress on a plane, yeah, you have a vector. When you, on that plane, choose a point and you have an infinity of planes, yeah, you have many, an infinite number of planes going through that point, then to define mathematically the state of stress at that point, we use what's called a tensor. And this is a second order tensor. So what happens? Imagine that at that point, you have a very small infinitesimal cube, this one, yeah? So imagine that the point is a very, very tiny, tiny cube. And this is how you can picture using a Cartesian coordinate system, the Cartesian coordinate system. And you can see what happens because now it's easy for you to imagine what happens on a plane. So on each, uh, on each side of the cube, it's a plane. So you see, we have these components. We can, we can decompose the stress on each little side in these three components, a normal one and two shear ones, yeah, using a Cartesian in 3D, a Cartesian coordinate system. So what happens, this is in static equilibrium. What this means, it doesn't rotate. So that means that this component, this shear component that you see here, and it tries to move the cube in that direction, it will be, equalized by this shear component that tries to move, to rotate the cube in, in the other direction. So this component and you see ZY and YZ are equal actually, and the same happens everywhere. So this is a symmetric tensor actually, it's a symmetric tensor. So these components are equal and different signs. And this is explained here in static equilibrium and in rocks in general, you have static equilibrium. So what happens, imagine that 
you may choose the coordinate system, these three coordinates, any way you want, any way you want. And let's say you choose them in such a way that they coincide with these three principal directions. And then if you do that, and you choose them in the three principal directions, then on the sides of the cube, as you choose it, you will have no shear stresses. You'll have only normal stresses and, and it'd be these ones. So this description of the state of stress and this description of the state of stress are exactly the same, but they use a different, uh, a different uh, Cartesian coordinate system. Yeah, with different directions. If you find the principal directions of stress, then the description of the tensor is this. If you choose any direction, does matter what, what, the description of the tensor would be this, yeah? So you see, we use mathematics because it kind of brings some order into our mind and makes us understand these things, yeah? So there will be three directions in such a way that the cube will have no shear stresses, yeah? And this is what this, what I've shown you previously geometrically with the ellipsoid, it, it, it's the same thing, yeah? So you'll see this and you'll see why we need to use algebra in a bit. So this is the thing. We talk about isotropic stress, lithostatic stress, hydrostatic stress in the liquids, yeah? But now we are in the rocks. And let's say in the rocks, you have a total stress tensor. Yeah, the total stress can be represented by an ellipsoid, you see it here. And you can imagine that this situation that is different from a liquid, can, we can think about it in such a way. We can think that we have a mean stress, yeah, an isotropic component. If we were to, to basically um, calculate what uh, the mean stress would be. If we take sigma one plus sigma two plus sigma three, divide them by three, that would be the mean stress. And we can think about this total stress tensor as having an isotropic component and an anisotropic component, which is this one. Now, this one is called deviatoric stress tensor. Deviation, yeah? Deviatoric. It deviates from the mean. So it deviates from the state of stress that you have in liquids. So what this tells you, because these stresses, they cause deformation in rocks. That's what we want to get. They are the cause of deformation. So let's think what kind of deformation will this cause? So this isotropic stress will just cause a change in volume, a dilation. It can be if it's compressive stress, yeah, compressive, it will basically, let's say you take a balloon, you put it in water, take it to uh, 10 meters, and we, it will get compressed, yeah? But the shape is exactly the same, it's a sphere. Now, when you have a deviatoric stress tensor, this component, it will not only due to this component change its volume, it will change its shape. And that's why you start thinking, oh, so when I see rocks that got deformed, that kind of something happened to them and they got deformed, that means that it wasn't just a change in volume, they got more compact. No, they actually had to change shape. Like, volumes of rocks got deformed, yeah, distorted. And we call that distortion, we call it strain. And we'll talk about strain next, next week. All right, now we are talking about the causes of deformation. All right, so I'm teaching you this, not because I really enjoy it, but because it's part of structural geology. And if some of you will become structural geologists, or some of you will become civil engineers, these are things you deal with, yeah? So here, again, I'm showing you the algebraic way of seeing things and the geometric way of seeing things. 
exactly what I told you, the geometric way of seeing things. The isotropic component will lead to the change of volume. The deviatoric component of stress will lead to a change in shape. Yeah, so what was a cube, you see a parallelipiped here, for instance, yeah? So this is how our mind functions. We have to kind of divide what is wholesome. Yeah, in nature, no one stays, nature doesn't think about this, but we do. We reflect on nature and to understand what happens, we have to, to basically understand what to, in the way we can manage yeah, these steps. All right, so this is deviatoric stress. It's a concept that I wanted to introduce to you. You see what it does. You will find something called differential stress. Yeah, differential stress. It, it has a very simple definition. Differential stress is a, the, uh, you see, difference between the maximum principal stress and the minimum principal stress. Yeah, so this is called differential stress. The reason it is important is that um, it has a limit. The differential stress can be only a certain magnitude depending on the rock. What happens, imagine this, what I'm showing here, imagine a cylinder of rock. The rock mechanicists, what they do, they take cylinders of rocks and put them into apparatuses. And uh, they basically apply uh, confining pressure here. So they apply equal stress on the uh, sides of the cylinder. And the, so this would be the equivalent of sigma three and sigma two, but sigma two would be equal to, to sigma three. So the same stress, you can imagine, they can pump a fluid, increase the pressure of the fluid, and the pressure would be everywhere the same around this, this cylinder. And then they push, they have some you know metal parts and they push and they, this would be the principal maximum stress. So the differential stress would be the difference between this one and this one. And they want to see at what differential stress the rock breaks. Yeah, the short vector, uh, Laura, would be sigma three, and it's equal here with sigma two. Yeah. In these experiments, what, when people do this thing, this is sigma three, and this is sigma one. And they, they establish a sigma three, and then they push with sigma one. And what happens, they wanna see when the rock breaks. So you see here for different rocks, you see different rocks, what the differential stress was when they broke. And this is called the strength of the rock, the strength of the rock. Now you might wonder what's the applicability of this, geologically speaking. Well, <laughs> it's great because the apl applicability is, uh, yeah, sigma two is equal with sigma three here. It would be perpendicular, if this is sigma three, Laura, this uh, is sigma two perpendicular to sigma three and to sigma one, but it's equal here. So what happens is, imagine you have a piece of crust. You're welcome, Laura, a piece of crust. And due to lithostatic pressure at a certain depth, you have lithostatic pressure. That would be equivalent to sigma three, yeah? All around. But then at the margin of the plate, you have a big stress coming, yeah? That is sigma one. Now, how big should it get to break that rock? and to have faults forming in that rock. So we do these experiments because we have to understand how the faults we see formed, yeah? So that's the idea. That's why you have to introduce these rock mechanics concepts. All right, I have to move on because I know it is very dense, but you'll have time to read in the, in the book as well. Uh, I have to introduce to you what David <laughs> was mentioning to me. And this is a more circle. Please pay attention to me. Don't, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you very simple what it means. We looked at the beginning at calculating sigma n and sigma s. Yeah. And we ha had a, an algebraic way of doing it. 
Otto Mohr in the 19th century was a German engineer and he realized that instead of doing trigonometry and calculating every time sine, cosine times uh, sigma one, sigma blah, blah, doing these things, he can get the value of sigma n and sigma s on any plane by using geometry. And this is called in his honor, the Mohr circle. This is the real space, the physical space. You have a, a test here. You have a cylinder of rock and you apply, you apply sigma one here, you apply sigma three here. The question is, what is sigma n here? What is sigma s here? Yeah, sigma two is perpendicular to the plane. So what, how do you calculate them? Sigma n and sigma s using trigonometry as I show, I've shown you at the beginning or using the Mohr circle. The Mohr circle gets constructed like this. This is the axis of sigma s. So on this axis, you are gonna read the value of this component, sigma s. So you are gonna read it here. This is the ac axis of sigma n, normal stresses. Here you will read the value of the sigma n component. And then we have here sigma one and sigma three in this plane. Sigma two is irrelevant here. It is perpendicular on this plane. It is irrelevant to these components. It doesn't come into the formula of these components. So what happens, Otto Mohr said sigma one is a normal stress. Sigma three is a normal stress. Sigma one is normal on this plane. Sigma three is normal on this plane. So he put here sigma one, he put here sigma three. He drew a circle through, through them. Sigma one minus sigma three, the diameter of the circle is the differential stress. Yeah. Now, this is the center of the circle is sigma one plus sigma three divided by two. That means this is the mean stress in this plane. Yeah, mean stress, which means that the radius of the circle gives you the deviatoric stress. It's sigma one minus this, for instance. But I'll show you later. So he drew a circle through here. And then he said, I wanna find out the component sigma n and the component sigma s for a plane with this inclination, theta. So if the inclination is theta in the more space, you count twice times two times theta, you draw this radius and you get this point on the circle. And you take the coordinates of this point, sigma n and sigma s. These two coordinates give you the value of sigma n and sigma s for the plane with the inclination theta. So from the physical space to the Otto Mohr circle, these are the rules of the game. You draw the circle through sigma one and sigma three, you always take twice the value of the inclination angle in the physical space, and you get the point on the Mohr circle, and you read the coordinates, and those are sigma n and sigma s. It's a very, very powerful tool, because instead of doing trigonometrics calculations and so on, Otto Mohr didn't have computers. Now I have computers, we can put in the, the formulas, and the computer would give us sigma n and sigma s. But think about this. Otto Moore didn't have computers, but he gave all the engineers in this world a wonderful gift. He said, guys, you don't have to start calculating trigonometric functions. Look, do this, and you will know what the sigma n and sigma s on any plane, what they are, okay? So you will have time to read this text. I explained what is in this text, I explained to you. Let's look here. I will not explain everything. This is from a different book, so slightly different notations. Again, you see the sigma one, sigma three. This is a physical space. So the question is, what is sigma n and sigma s on this plane? This plane is theta here. It's the same. It's theta between these two directions is theta here, yeah? So what happens is, look how it was constructed. Twice theta, the radius, this is a point, you read this, okay? And these are the formulas. These are the formulas that we basically uh, 
discussed. Yeah, you can see them here. This plus this, you will get to the formula at the beginning. All right, so now another example. If you take two planes, yeah, at a distance at an angle distance alpha, yeah. The, the angle distance between the two planes is alpha. So it, you have theta, the first plane, this is theta plus alpha here. So first, the first point on this plane, the state of stress is given by this point, yeah, twice theta. Then plus twi twice alpha, yeah, because you rotate like this, the state of stress on this plane is given by this point, yeah, reading the coordinates of this. Just as an example, it is explained here. Again, think about this yeah they they show here what happens on two perpendicular directions yeah on this plane and on this plane for instance actually you will end up you will end up because there are 90 degrees between the two planes 90 degrees times twice times two is 100 degrees in the more space so you this point and this point and basically you get the state of stress. Obviously you'll have similar, similar shear stresses. As we discussed on the cube, the, the tangential shear stresses are opposite signs, yeah, different signs, but equal magnitudes because it's in a state of equilibrium, this cube. And here, another example, this is very important because these are what's called conjugate planes. So many, many faults forming conjugates uh, conjugate uh, pairs yeah in these two directions conjugate directions and you can see their relationships yeah so you will have time to go through this through the more uh, more circle representation yeah the reason i'm insisting on it is because you'll do mechanical del continuo this term is jill doing it usually it is in dira and they will give you problems with the more circle and these kind of things. So I want you to be prepared for this course as well. Yeah. Now, in the book, this is something I don't want you to memorize these things. All you have to do is understand uh, some notions here. Yeah. So basically, in the reality, we have a three dimensional state of stress sigma one sigma two and sigma three depending on which plane you consider the one formed by sigma one and sigma three you do the more circle like this and you look at what happens in that plane you can take the plane sigma one sigma two yeah or sigma two and sigma three so you have a more circle for each of them so you reduce the three-dimensional problem to a two-dimensional problem yeah by taking pairs pairs of these main components of stress. And you see the most general state of stress is called three axial state of stress. We have three axes and different stresses. Now, when one stress is zero, yeah, B axial, you see it, a B axial because we have two stresses basically that matter. Yeah, uh, the, when two stresses are zero, yeah, let's say you take the cylinder of rock and you just press it, you don't apply, you don't apply pressure on it, then this is called uniaxial compression. So you'll hear about uniaxial compression experiments, for instance. In engineering, they do a, a lot of uniaxial tension, they pull things because the strength of materials when they pull is much less than when you press. So in engineering, what yields first yeah what causes failure first is when things get pulled because the strength of material is less in tension than in compression so engineers will work a lot on this side on this side of the more space yeah this is called biaxial st state of stress again you have one like here you have one of the stresses but in this case sigma 2 being um, zero and this is a particular case we talked what happens in water or in any liquid, yeah? Uh, we have hydrostatic, hydrostatic stress. And in the lithosphere, when we don't have other stresses to deviate the situation from the lithostatic state of stress, yeah? So you see the more circle here reduces to a point. That means 
that er everywhere in any direction we have only normal stress and it's the same yeah that's the idea okay i know it is a lot uh, i'm giving you this again you don't have to memorize anything all you will have to do is understand this understand what it means physically you don't have to memorize okay here as i told you from the beginning this would be called this radius deviatoric stress the reason being again the reason being that this is a mean yeah mean state of stress okay and the diameter is differential stress according to the definition it's sigma one minus sigma three okay so you can think about the state of stress if you take the mean to the origin in the more space this is the real state of stress but if you want to represent it it only as a deviatoric state of stress it's this yeah okay so that's the idea all this is a bit artificial and mathematical i i fully agree with you so please bear with me i'm i give you a 100 percent guarantee yeah 100 percent guarantee that we will get to that part of the course where we will discuss geology yeah so i had to introduce this concepts in a um, in an orderly manner now here is a bit of geology yeah we discussed about stress in the lithosphere um, because the situation of stress in the lithosphere is very very complex uh, there are uh, a lot of states of stress and various uh, causes for it but anyway when we talk about tectonic stresses yeah you can think about you know locally speaking uh the state of stress the reference state of stress let's say it's lithostatic yeah lithostatic and suddenly from somewhere there is a push yeah and that is tectonic stress for instance okay so tectonic stress will lead to deviation from the reference state of stress yeah and they are obviously a consequence of tectonic processes of what happens far away but that's how mount, mountains get built for instance uh, basins get formed and so on so the idea is that um we talk uh in in the uh, um in the case of the lithosphere about tectonic forces and we we, we talk about them being compressional extensional or strike slip regimes yeah causing yeah these deviations lead to one of these regime uh, compressional extensional strike slip and in the 1950s yeah so a long time ago 70 years ago so yeah 70 i think it was 1951 anderson had this um yeah you see 1951 had this uh, paper published and he of course we have some ideal conditions he discusses it in the paper but i think it's a very good way of picturing what's happening so we talk about the three principal stresses yeah three principal stresses think about the region where the main stress the main stress the principal uh, maximum stress comes from above maybe because the weight of rocks above is very high yeah and this regime is pictured here and it's called the normal fault regime it will cause normal faults this is a normal fault now think about think about um, a regime where the vertical principal stress sigma 2 the intermediate one yeah so sigma 1 and sigma 3 are horizontal and this is called the strike slip regime yeah and it causes strike slip faults like the big faults like the san andreas fault in california for instance it is a strike slip fault we talk about strike slip regime the anatolian fault in in turkey for instance yeah it is a strike slip fault and strike slip faults are big headaches for human society because very strong earthquakes are associated with them very damaging and that leads to loss of life yeah so uh, that's why people study the strike slip regime a lot and when the vertical principal stress is the smallest one sigma three 
we talk about the thrust fault regime. And this is a typical regime that leads to mountain building. Yeah, you have remote principal principal stresses from the plate boundaries building mountains yeah leading this principal maximum stresses horizontal in the lithosphere and leading to thrusts thrusts are low angle faults along which big big parts of crust are thrust yeah put one on top of the other and that's how you get the mountains that's what the cordillera oriental here in bogota is yeah, sedimentary rocks that were formed in a sedimentary basin in an ocean were thrust up on top of other volumes of rocks due to this regime. So you can see that with all the pain we went through, uh, all this mathematics, all this, uh, yeah, sigma one is always the designation of sigma one uh, is always as the principal strongest, biggest principal stress. Yeah, this was a question. So for instance, <laughs> you're well, uh, welcome, David. Uh, for instance, we will discuss tectonics and you will like tectonics. I'm, I'm pretty sure you will all love tectonics. Uh, and this is an, a, a, a preview, a little preview, when we will discuss about what happens, how we get the mountains there and so on. So the idea is that what you see here, you learned geology, the geology course, yeah? And you learned about plate tectonics. Um, oh, Laura wants the last slide. Yes, Laura, what is the question? You can talk. Yeah, teacher, sorry. I draw the, the faults and <laughs> wait a minute. Um, yes, uh, are you I'm okay? Drawing. So. I'm drawing the faults. Oh, the, okay, but the you, you of the faults. Yeah, yeah, okay. But you, what you can do, Laura, you can download this presentation from Sequoia Plus. And yeah, you can, teacher, but you I'm not in the talk. class. Oh, you're I not saw, in the class. I saw okay. this subject one year ago, and okay. I'm here to reverse. I, okay. I don't know if you know well, that. You that have that to. Happens. You have to With contact me. Sir? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I want you to, have to contact, contact me, and I'll send you. I'll give you permission to to access the classes. Oh, okay. you can. Okay. Oh, thanks, thanks, thanks. All right. It's great for me. Okay, so what I'm uh, I was trying to show is that if you look at this, you learned about plate tectonics a bit. We'll discuss in more detail this, but and it's a theory. It's a theory, yeah. So it is our understanding of things right now. Um, it's like a, a very strong hypothesis. So the idea is that if you look at these arrows, yeah, these arrows, uh, we are talking about a normal fault stress regime and you see the, the vertical arrow is bigger. So the vertical, the principal, maximum principal stress sigma one is vertical here. And the reverse fault, yeah, uh, or the strike slip regime, sigma one is horizontal. Yeah, depending which one is vertical, sigma two or sigma three, we can have strike slip or reverse or thrust fall. So this is what this show. So you see here in the mountain belt, you see, then you see the hinterland here, you see a, a basin here. So at different locations, you can see what the state of stress is. I'm not insisting on you now memorizing this and because it has some logic why it's like that. We are just putting brick by brick, yeah? I'm just showing you that these things have a logic why they are like this. Um, anyway, this is the idea that we use this understanding of these stresses to understand what happens in the lithosphere and in the crust and what leads to the deformation to the features that we see. Yeah, that's the idea. Now people, what they have done, structural geologists, so those of you who who will become active in structural geology, academically speaking, and not in terms of in exploration and so on, you might be involved in the World Stress Map Project, where you will try to measure, the pre to determine the principal direction of stress at different parts of the crust, yeah? And you see the regimes here, yeah, the maximum 
horizontal stress and you see different regimes uh, in different places and they kind of agree with the plate tectonic makeup here. But there are many deviations because as I said, our planet is much more complex than our idealized representation of it. And as you can see, there are huge tracts, huge tracts on the continents where we don't know much. So those of you who will find an interest in this, there is plenty of work to do. Yeah, as you can see, it's not a complete map. Anyway, what I want you to do, please, please, uh, I'm not giving you to read things to punish you. I, I, there's no, no, it has nothing to do with this. Please read it to understand what we discussed in this, uh, in this lecture. Um, I feel for you because I know that I'm pushing a bit too much, but I don't have time in one term to teach structural geology and tectonics. This is a decision of the um, department. So you have a voice and voice has to be, we need to have a longer course, like a one year course, one structural geology and one tectonics and so on. Of course, I will do it with a limit. Yeah, so, so I will not, uh, it's an introductory course. So I want you to be as much prepared as possible. Yeah, I want to prepare you as professionals. That's my point. Okay, so please read these things. And when you have doubts, you can contact me. We can discuss. No problem. But many things will be clearer after you read yeah, the text. Thank you very much to all of you. Muchas gracias. Um, yo voy a detener el compartido. Y if you have questions, please ask them. If you don't, please have a wonderful afternoon. Great weekend. I'll see you on Tuesday. We'll talk about strain. Yeah. And um, then we'll talk about rheology. And after the first test, we'll start talking about folds and folds and other things. All right. Thank you very much to all of you. No, teacher. Thank you. Yeah, teacher. To you. No, you are very welcome. All of you. All of you. Thank you.